Welcome to this uh, seminar where we will be discussing the report, A Vision for Digital Europe, from the Taming of Unruly Platforms to a New Digital Humanism. The report was commissioned by the Friedrich Ebert Foundation and written by Thomas Gegenhuber of Lufana University in Lunenburg. Um, this seminar is jointly hosted by uh, the Friedrich Ebert Foundation and the think tank Arena Idea, where I work. My name is uh, Herman Bender, and I am the head of labor market and education policy at Arena Idea. I will be moderating this seminar and the following conversation. Um, a brief outline of today's seminar. We'll start off uh, with a brief introduction by Philip Fink, who is the director of uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung in the Nordic countries. Then uh, Thomas Gegenhuber will have about 20 minutes at his disposal to present his report. After that, we will be given two comments by, uh, uh, of about 10 minutes each. The first is by Maya Fiastad, who is State Secretary at the Ministry of Health and Social Affairs and also Associated Professor at the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH in Stockholm. The second commentary will be provided by Jens Zimmermann, who is a member of the German Bundestag and digital policy spokesman for the SPD parliamentary group. Uh, after these two comments, we will have a panel discussion on various related topics. And this panel can, uh, includes the previously mentioned participants and also Karin Pettersson, who is the cultural editor at Sweden's largest newspaper, Aftonbladet and has also written a book on the ways in which the Silicon Valley version of the internet poses a threat to democracy. So to sum up, uh, I think we can look forward to a stimulating hour with a range of perspectives on today's topic, a vision for digital Europe. And I will now pass the word to our first speaker, Philip Fink of the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Philip, please. Thank you very much, Herman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a very warm welcome to our joint FES and ARENA group and seminar on regulating platform services and the platform economy. My name is Philip Fink. I'm director of the FES Nordic office in Stockholm. Uh, for those of you who do not know the, F the, F the FES, we are a political foundation from Germany and we are closely aligned to the Social Democratic Party. We have offices in over 115 countries and uh, we have an office in Stockholm since the year 2006. And our goal in the Nordic countries is to enhance the debate between German and Nordic progressive actors on the issues pertaining to welfare, economic and labor, as well as foreign policy areas. Um, today's seminar is a very timely event, not only because Amazon has recently opened its offices in Sweden, but also because platform services, especially consumer and office services, belong to the, to the winners of the current global pandemic with record increases in turnover, profits and rising market shares. These developments again call for a debate on how to regulate the digital platforms or the platform economy as their market power in some cases, monopolistic positions is a cause for rising concern and has led to increased action and antitrust investigations. Similarly, their employment practices and working conditions have been repeatedly criticized and there have been rising calls to regulate digital platforms. However, what should the focus of regulation be and what types of regulation come into question? And more importantly, what should the goal of platform regulation be? We would like to discuss these and further questions in our seminar today. And so we've asked Thomas Gegenhuber, um, the author of a um, widely acclaimed study for the FES to put forward his ideas for a strategy for the regulation of platforms in the EU. And I'm very pleased that my FES did, uh, State Secretary in the Swedish Ministry of Health and Social Affairs, has found time in this very pressing period uh, to join us and to bring an input from a Swedish perspective on the issue of regulating the platform economy. Jens Zimmermann, thank you very much Jens for being with us. Uh, we'll bring in a German perspective on the issue of regulating Amazon and co. As you may know, um, there is a strong tradition in Germany for data protection, and there are different debates in Sweden and in Germany, so it will be very enlightening to see where uh, the differences are. 
And um, thank you again for joining us. And uh, I'd also like to thank Karin Pet uh, Petterson from um, Aftonbladet uh, for joining us in discussion. I very much look forward to hearing your insights um, on the issue. Uh, finally, I would like to thank Michael Büscher from the FES Nordic Offer and Office and Herman Bender from Arena Gruppen for organizing today's event. Herman will moderate today's seminar. And finally, a big thank you to Arena Gruppen for making today's event possible. Herman, the screen is yours. Thank you, Philip. Uh, we will now quickly move on to the main event, uh, I should say, of today, which is Thomas Gegenhuber's presentation of his report. Uh, uh, you'll have about 20 minutes and then we'll move on to the commentaries. Please, Thomas, go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for having me and uh, having the opportunity to present uh, my, my study. And the idea came for Vision for Digital Europe or this idea that it's always about two things. We need to make space for something, but if we want to create space for something, we want to regulate issues, then the question is space for what? So I, I want to dive into those questions. And, and the idea for why, why I call it a European platform for digital humanism, because every fall in the city of Linz, which is my hometown, uh, there is every year the Ars Electronica conference, which is a conference in the European spirit, bringing together the arts, the sciences, uh, but also entrepreneurial spirit all together in, in a big conference. And, and I saw this really nice map um, collecting different, connecting the dots. What are European projects that speak to the values of, of, of a digital humanism already going on in Europe? And then it inspired me also for the title and, and, and thinking about this paper. But let's get, get started with the question is, it's obvious there is the growing monopolies, the growing power of Amazon, Facebook, Google and co, uh, that they occupy too much space uh, in, in, in our societies. And, and I use these pictures because, yes, I think it's the job of us Europeans, because obviously no one else is doing that at the moment to create a space uh, and, and to um, diminish the power of those platforms. Uh, and one example, and Philip mentioned it before, is of course Amazon. If you think, I mean, Amazon's business model of not only this major growing platform in e-commerce, but having a double role. They are market organizers, and in the same time, they operate on their own market. And that the European Union uh, says, no, nah, we think this double role is, is, uh, is not something we appreciate. I think it's a good way uh, forward. Uh, this is a press release from a recent uh, initiative the European Commission set. India, for example, is even far more radical in those approaches and they deliberately say as a platform you need to decide either your platform organizer or you a merchant or a trader on the platform, but you can't be both. And I think this is one of the regulative steps we need to be. Uh, it's just not, it's at the moment the platforms, whatever they're allowed to do or whatever is a gray zone, they take over this gray zone. So we need to be really clear of uh, creating space and, and making clear what the role is. Also about uh, labor conditions at Amazon. This is uh, an image from the protest at um, uh, in Germany that uh, the German labor unions organized this idea of who bears the costs of Amazon business models. And we know uh, from the distribution centers uh, how everything is timed, how everything is tightly regulated and the dystopia for those who ever read uh, from Rob Hart, The Warehouse, uh, the dystopia of this fictional book and the reality in the Amazon warehouses, there's, there's nothing, they're almost very similar. So there's also an issue here about uh, the labor and the working conditions uh, in, in the Amazon distribution centers that, that we should care about. But also, if you go take other platforms, uh, this is a poster here in, uh, in Berlin uh, questioning Airbnb's role in fooling the gentrification and, and the shortage of uh, affordable housing in, in various districts in, in Berlin. 
uh, a simply regulatory solution is, yes, you can rent out an Airbnb, but it should be only a part of your room on a certain amount of days to prevent that there is a kind of shadow hotel industry emerging uh, um, in, in the various cities where a lot of tourists are. I mean, the COVID situation now it's different, but I think, yes, Airbnb can exist, but certainly we need to regulate it in a meaningful way. And Jens is here and, and he can talk about that probably also is like a thing that the that initiative that's happening here in Germany um, is, is uh, the idea of, hey, we need to regulate Google and the large uh, corporations by creating data as a common resource that is shared by everyone. So redistribution of, of data to make uh, a more equal competitive playing field. But we, I think we can uh, talk about that more detail in discussion. But my hunch is, okay, this was just a very brief, okay, we know platforms have a tendency for monopolistic uh, situations. Obviously they accumulate too much power and this is concerning and we need to create space and we need to reduce their power. But then always the question is, okay, if we create space, who's fill the space that, that we want? Like what, what are the alternatives? And I always believe, uh, and, and I think it's, it's a good insight from, I also teach strategy courses, always having a reactive strategy means you're always reacting. Um, and the big question is, what's the forward looking strategy? What's the attack? What's, what is the vision that the European Union, Germany, Sweden, and the countries uh, in, in, in our societies have in contrast to the Chinese or to the American model. So what's the alternative? So if we regulate the platforms, but what do we want to do differently? Do we have an idea? Uh, and, and this is hard because we are, the, the space is so dominated uh, by the other ideal types. And my very humble, I would say, uh, is outlining some pathways where we could go uh, based on examples we already see. And I think we should say we want a proactive shaping of a digital humanism that's, that's deeply driven by values that we cherish, like uh, sovereignty, data sovereignty, and data protection. The issue of sustainability, not only in ecological terms, but certainly also um, uh, sustainable, su sustainable and decent work uh, and sustainable institutions. Uh, the issue about equality, uh, how are the surplus value that's generated distributed? Uh, what about empowerment of our citizens? And, and of course, the values of, of freedom. So all the ideas I'm presenting you now are, are, are speaking deeply to those values. And one thing is, creating public online spaces. And I know there are debates and I, I really like in, in Germany, we have private TV and we have public TV. We have private podcasters and public broadcasts. If you think in social media, we have private social media platforms and we have private social media platforms. Where is the public space there? And, and I don't wanna go because I know there are ideas going around the public broadcasters should be platform providers themselves, especially in a domain of uh, platforms where we proactively make sense of this world and digest information. But I'm actually su suggesting let's start a little bit smaller. Let's, let's, let's take, because I like to work in prototypes. And one of my prototypes is what are the most visited websites in this world? And if you go, and I mean, it takes us a while. If you go through the list, it's all commercial, commercial in America and China. And although Wikipedia is also in the category of United States, we know it's a globally operating platform that's governed by the comments. And it's in the top 15. If you want to make sense of this world and you want to find something out, you go on Google and the likelihood that on the five or the seven first research results, there's a Wikipedia page is very likely. So Wikipedia is a universal source of information, 
which is particularly important of fake news and no one, what are the institutions we try to make sense of this world. So Wikipedia is doing a good job. Like it's pretty high there in the most um, popular websites in the world. And an example from, from Germany, Germany has really the public broadcaster do a lot of great video content. And this is Terra X, and this is a, a documentary about climate change and, and, and climate, uh, climate topics and kind of these kind of things. And at the same time, Wikipedia is really bad or they don't have the resources at video content. So you have one of the most visited platforms in the world that's governed by the comments who is not good at video. And you have an all over Europe public broadcasters who are really great at producing good video content. So let's bring those platforms together. And this is actually the Terra X videos because they're on the Creative Commons license and now integrated in the German website on, on climate change. And given that we know that this is a contested topic because some people try to contest the fact that we have climate change, it's important that we bring those two value spheres together. And I think that's the first step of uh, creating public spaces and platforms. And this is an article from my colleague, Lina Dobusch, and, and he says the important thing to make this happen, there are certain technical aspects is we need to have open licensing. All public broadcasting content needs to be on the, in an open license. And, and there are other technical server issues as well, but this is one idea I think where we can achieve and reach more people with the public broadcasting value we already serve in the internet. Then in general, foster comments and openness, all open data, open science, open source. This is something we need to expand on. And here's an example, I, this article is in Germany, but I just want to emphasize that the University of Osnabrück, instead of using Zoom, was able to have the entire digital education infrastructure on open source based models. And then I'm thinking, if we have an entrepreneurial state, if it works well at this university, I don't have user tests, but it seems when I get, got it from this article, it works well. If this works well in one university, what could we do to scale that in Germany as a government? We have a prototype at a local university, then we take more resources and we use those resources to improve the product because improving product, achieving high usability takes time and resources. But we have, if we have a working prototype, Let's, let's scale those, those alternatives. That's a way how we can uh, move forward. We should do more to change the male dominated tech culture, which is originating in Silicon Valley. Uh, I was in Silicon Valley myself. And, and if you look at the newspapers and I remember the stories of, of, of uh, 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 a few women coming from a more disadvantaged neighborhood, joining a tech conference and they were like, shocked what kind of ideas uh, the boys had about what could tech be used for uh, uh, and the sexist culture that was going around there. And it's deeply ingrained in this startup scaling fast, scaling big, get rich until you've, you're 40, work 70 hours all the time culture. It's not a sustainable culture. And, and, and also the, the misincentives of, of uh, um, venture capital, if you take Uber, I mean, it's not like that this is all productive capitalism that's happening here. And again, I suggest let's start small. This is a, a Rails beginners workshop from Code Curious. It's, it's an uh, open community um, in, in Germany who teach women and, and uh, transgender people how to code. They start with nothing. But they do teaching code with a different culture. They have a different DNA, how to teach tech and how they think te uh, tech and coding could be used. So it's a different culture that differs from other environments where, where and how people learn coding. And uh, a friend of mine, she's in Canada, she, she, and this is a story from actually interviewed those people telling a story of a psychology student, didn't got a job, really got into this community and after sticking to the community and investing a lot of time into coding, she actually was able to learn to get an entry level job in, in the coding sector. Um, so 
And, and my colleague, I showed this here in Canada, we can learn from Canada, my colleague, Vanny Sukia Ryerson, this woman entrepreneurship hub, again, trying to foster different digital entrepreneurship culture and building uh, more valuable and sustainable startups. There's a lot we can do better. We can support more digital volunteer work. We need to energize and mobilize the citizens from all societal sectors. In this is uh, an example from the Wir versus Virus hackathon of the German federal government, where citizens from all societal sectors came together. How can we find solution to the COVID crisis? And this Corano, I, unfortunately, it's in German. There's no English website, about, but what it does is to make contact tracing more efficient by providing digital tools to health agencies who still were used to work with Excel files. And speed and efficiency matters in the COVID crisis. And here you have citizens who produce a really cool tool to, to make governments more efficient. And they actually, uh, a few um, health agencies already adopted their tool. Here, German federalism is making it hard to scale it up, but citizens can actually produce good products that we can use and imp help improve our government. So let's take citizens part of the journey. We can support alternative platforms such as platform cooperatives. Not all platforms need global network effects. Uh, this is a frequent mentioned example, Up and Go, it's a cleaning cooperative in, in NYC, which is owned by the workers. And whereas you have on, on, on for-profit platforms, 20% or 15% goes to the platform of each uh, dollar you earn. And Up and Go is just 5%. Um, so this is, makes definitely a difference. You have to say, though, if you look deeper into this example, there was a foundation behind it, giving several million dollars to those uh, platform uh, corporate to make it work. But still, we, I, I, we can imagine for certain services that a European network of cooperatives emerges where you share the tech solutions and, and you, you kind of think of how could the public kind of, I, I would say, what's the public equivalent to venture capital? Where are the Staatsfonds or, you know, government funds, investors who would invest in, in such initiatives that try to make the platform economy fairer? And this brings me to the point, of course, we need to build new ecosystems. We need to think innovation broader. We need to foster social innovation. We need a strong entrepreneurial state who operates in an investor who, of course, enables through funding new initiatives, but also becomes himself an economic owner because it makes a difference uh, which products the state buys or not. Should the state uh, buy Zoom products or should it invest into open source products? Certainly makes a difference. So this was an overview, more thoughts in, in my study, which is, was also published in English. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I seem to have some trouble with my video. I, I don't know if I'm visible. No? All right. Well, you hear me anyway, so <laughs> we can move on to the first commentary by Maya Fiastad. Um, who I introduced previously, I will do it again. She is State Secretary at the Ministry of Health and Social Affairs and also Associate Professor at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. So please, Maya, uh, your comments on Thomas' presentation. Thank you so much, Shemal. I, I can't see myself, can you see me? Does my video work for you? No? We can hear you, but we can't see you. We can hear you, Maya. <laughs> okay. You can try That's and good... uh, maybe stop the video and start it again. Or Kalle, uh, if you... No, oh, there, there no you maybe. Oh, yes. perfect. Thank you. Sorry. Sometimes helps to be an engineer in this, uh, con this situation. Sometimes not, actually. Some short uh, thank you so much, Professor Gegenüber, for this very interesting 
uh, overview. Uh, I really enjoy that it's such broad overview of the digital world. And uh, as uh, Sherman maybe indicated in the beginning here, that uh, I'm, I have been in the midst of the Swedish uh, COVID-19 response during the last uh, 10 months. And uh, uh, maybe as Sherman didn't say, but possibly thought, how can she have time to spend time on digital uh, freedom? But uh, I must say that uh, the possibilities of robust digital information is very central also in the discussion the pandemic. Um, WHO has spoken about an infodemic in the traces of COVID-19. I mean, we have many problems with, with information. And uh, personally, I think that one of the most difficult things of handling this crisis has been that we are developing policy under so unsure, uh, with so unsure information. I mean, the, the, the science uh, around the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus has been so um, new and creating as we go. So I think actually that uh, information and the digital world is uh, very uh, central and interesting also when discussing COVID-19 response. But I will try to stick to the topic and not speak too much about pandemics. So I would just like to start by saying that to me, social democracy is really a movement of freedom. And the ultimate goal of social democracy is the freedom of the people. And to me, that is I think an important starting point also when discussing the digital world and the internet, of course, you know, in a broad sense has been a fantastic freedom movement. We see people all over the world, all of a sudden having the possibilities to access information, to access education, to have information that previously was hard to, to reach, for example, for women in many parts of the world, uh, information about their bodies, about abortion, uh, all this important information, and actually people all over the world creating content online. So I would start by saying that to me, um, internet is a freedom revolution. And uh, uh, just a disclaimer, I am personally very skeptic against filtering in, in all forms, uh, for example, the discussion about porn filters, etc. But with that said, uh, are there any uh, needs for regulations or discussions about the content of internet? The answer is, of course, yes. And just a few thoughts around your very interesting presentation, and I know there will be a discussion afterwards. Uh, I think that from the beginning of internet, it's been an unbelievable ignorance around the possibilities to apply already existing laws and regulations online. If we look at online violence, for example, I mean, threatening someone online is just as illegal as threatening someone in the real world. But there's been a problem of legal forces to take this seriously. Um, I think that there's actually a threat to democracy already there, that we create a, a separate system of, of laws or ethics, and that, that possibly the, the the notion of that the rule of law doesn't apply to the internet has been spread. Uh, and that, I think, uh, is dangerous. And we see that also in, you mentioned, um, Professor, the, the problems around Uber, of course, and the platform economy. And, and the real problems of the platform economy is the absence of social dialogue. And uh, we, for Sweden, we're very proud of our, our long uh, history of social dialogue and uh, a strong unions and uh, tripartite collaboration. And that is, of course, I think the main problem that uh, we haven't been able to, to organize that part of the world as efficiently. And that sometimes strikes me also about the social platforms, actually, that how did we how did we used to handle these kind of problems that, that one party with great power has the possibility to post um, demands on weaker power? Well, we usually uh, regulate that with collective agreement. And the why is it so difficult for users of the world to organize uh, when there really are all the possibilities? I think that's actually an interesting issue. But we also regulated um, the the labor market with laws and we sometimes forget that i mean there are there are uh, parts of the of work life that are not legal to to regulate in collective agreement for example work environment laws and that's also i think something that we can bring into the online world should it really be allowed to to you know check the dots for i accept the terms and regulations and you can hereby have my kidneys and there must be uh, legal restraints on what is not possible to, to um, have agreements on also online. And uh, 
I'm a historian of technology, and I think it's very interesting the relationship between policy and technology. There are uh, times when, when policy uh, drive technology. One example we often use in Sweden is our sulfur laws that were early in the 1970s. They actually led to a rapid um, development of environmental technology. But there are also many examples of new technology demanding new legislation or demanding new policy. I think the car is one of the most obvious examples. Of course, when the car came, it was completely uh, dangerous. You could drive everywhere. There were no specific roads. There were no safety belts. Uh, you didn't have to have a driver's license. Uh, but you know, with the years, um, policymakers uh, made up to speed for the car, and we had the driver's license. We have constructed our society around the car. We have the idea of sidewalks. Uh, we have uh, also interesting legislation around safety belts, etc. And I think that that is also relevant, actually, when discussing the information age. That sometimes we need to get up to speed with the technology, technological development, with legislation. And I think, of course, the, the issue of information is specifically interesting here. I know Karin will speak in the discussion afterwards, so I thought I, I don't need to put so much time in the social platforms issue. But uh, it's interesting how much of our worlds, of course, that are regulated by social media algorithms and the ignorance around these algorithms. And I think it's interesting, Professor, you, you raised the issue of, of what is a public space online. And I think one of the problems is that people uh, people view uh, Facebook, for example, as a public space. You know, this is an open dashboard. Everyone can ride on it. Of course, it's not. It's a commercial space. The, the aim of Facebook is to sell things through their ads. And you see information on Facebook that makes you want to buy things. It's not a, it's not a public space. It's not a neutral space. Uh, but the idea that people sometimes doesn't really realize that the 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 platforms they use for information sharing or, or um, like the and news or anything like that are commercial spaces. And uh, we have we created the rules of press, press ethics in the uh, 18th century. And we now actually have a situation that resembles the situation of the 18th century with, with rumors that are, cannot be confirmed, that are very widely spread. Etc. And we need to go back to that. And that is, of course, much more difficult now when we have um, when we have information spaces that are not national, because our legislation is national, our taxation is national, but all the global movements are transnational, and policymakers all around the world have to deal with that. I think. And uh, I think it's also interesting you speak about the the need for standards, and I think that's extremely interesting, also from a historical perspective. I mean. Locking consumers up in different standards is a really old uh, commercial secret or idea. Uh, for example, in Stockholm 100 years ago, you had to have two telephones, one to call within Stockholm and one to call the rest of the country. There are actually some historians that claim that this made many telephones being sold in Stockholm and that maybe laid the basis of the eventual success of Ellen Ericsson. Uh, and the, you, well, you all know the, the different standards of the railway systems in Europe, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I mean, why do I keep paying Netflix every month? It's not because I have much time to watch uh, online TV. It's because I'm afraid that I will forget, you know, which episode on Bones I was watching. And all this information that are being kept in the different platforms is, of course, a, a way of keeping uh, consumers. And I think that's a very interesting idea that you raised in your presentation. Uh, last, uh, I think it's also uh, uh, an idea that you, you raise, and I think it was very important that, I mean, technology is not self-driving force, I and mean, technology should be in the hands of democracy. And we cannot expect technology to, to steer at ideas of, of a better climate, for example. I mean, we have all these possibilities in digitalization to create better climate, to create technology that... Um, that works for democracy and against climate change. But this will not happen automatically. We have to have a uh, democratic influence over the technological development to make that happen. And I think it's, it's a dangerous notion, actually, that technology keeps developing and we just have to follow. I think we must help each other to combat that notion. That was some quick reflections on Professor Gegenieber's uh, presentation. Thank you. Looking forward to listening to the rest of you. Thank you so much, Maya. It's a really interesting remark. Uh, there's a lot of 
but to discuss there. Uh, technology should be in the hands of democracy, sort of a overarching theme of your comments. Um, let's move on to Jens Zimmerman uh, and your comments, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for um, bringing up this, this excellent panel together. And um, I think I can easily uh, continue on, on, on what, you, what you already said. And, but uh, first of all, I think it's crucial to, to underline, uh, I mean, we, in, in Germany over the last couple of years, um, they, they, the, the industry came up with the theme industry for O, for zero. So meaning what we're seeing digitization, automatization um, is something like a fourth industrial revolution. And um, if, we, if we agree on, on that assessment, I think this is uh, an important cornerstone because industrial revolutions were always times of, of disruption and always times um, where um, progressive forces need to be very cautious and were extremely needed and unions were needed and social democracy ultimately was needed um, to join forces to fight for people's rights and the workers' rights because during these times of disruptions, capital was always much faster and was accumulating much bigger than its... Uh, uh, then it would be healthy. So um, coming up with that assessment of the situation, um, I, I really loved what uh, Thomas was saying about um, the situation we are having in Europe. And I think it's also crucial to, to always have that European view on the situation because uh, I think uh, Europe is our only chance to, to play a role in this digital world. Um, but it can be still, it can be an important role because what Thomas was uh, referring to were European values and European values um, of uh, enlightenment. Um, so going back to Kant uh, and uh, thinking about um, also the situation we're having in China and having in the US, this is uh, our European opportunity and thinking about multilateralism and other like-minded nations. There are much more people living in nations outside the US and China. It's, it's important uh, to have that in mind. And this is a, a big opportunity for us um, in Europe. And I really love what Thomas was saying is that we need to come up with uh, concrete solutions because I mean, I'm doing this pitch uh, fighting for our European values for a long time now but it's really difficult to come up with really proper and concrete solutions to it. And um, I, I, I love all our open source initiatives and uh, very, very often they are superior uh, talking about from a technological point of view. But um, I mean, referring to, um, to Bill Clinton's famous sentence, it's the economy stupid, um, I would argue here, it's the user stupid, because this is, I, I think, the, the crucial aspect where um, the especially US platforms are, are so much better than we is user friendliness. So, um, I mean, you mentioned um, that video platform from that German university, um, which is for sure a, a better product than what we are using right now, Zoom, for example. Um, and we had that same debate here in Berlin because we had some schools here in Berlin, in Kreuzberg, where all these progressive programmers from all around the world are living. And when the schools went into lockdown, um, they argued, no, you can't use Zoom or a Cisco product or a Microsoft product. You need to go open source. And this was the right decision. But at the end of the day, um, the teachers and also other parents were complaining, as long as we were using Zoom, um, teaching worked. But then these progressive parents came in and we needed to use that difficult open source product. And um, one third of the pupils wasn't able to participate 
in the lectures. Uh, and I think this is one example. It's, it's about usability, it's about the users, um, and it's also about um, pushing products into the market. This is, I think, where we need to be uh, to become better in, in Europe in general. And in addition um, um, to, to what we heard from also from Maya as a, as a policymaker, as a legislator, we need to be much faster with legislation because this is one of the problems. We are very often, we are not fast enough creating a proper framework for new technologies because um, especially, uh, especially on the left uh, and in social democracy, we all always feel a little, we are always a little bit afraid that um, people from, from the industry will come and, and say, look at these social democrats, they are only about regulation and they, they, they stop the progress and we will be uh, lagging behind because all of this legislation. I and I think that's wrong because when we are creating a proper framework, this gives also smaller companies the opportunity uh, to innovate faster because um, Coming back to the Uber platform, I mean, simply um, simply having a platform where you can illegally offer taxi rides, this is not really creative because this is also a, a 100 year old business using your private car standing in front of an airport and offering people, I will bring you into the city center for half the price. This is not innovation. It is simply um, the idea of not sticking to the rules. And so um, talking about uh, really innovative services, I think it's crucial that we are also getting much, much faster as legislators uh, with coming up with, with, new, with new solutions to it. And uh, I, have a, I have a quite interesting example because it's not only about the legislators, it's also about the administration. Our administration is not fit um, for innovating fast with, with uh, regulation. I, um, I'm also serving on the, on the finance committee in, in the German Bundestag. And uh, what I was noticing is that European legislation is uh, putting um, our traditional banking system under a lot of stress. The payment service directive, um, it opened all the bank accounts to third party applications and it created a lot of innovation, which is a good thing. Um, but then I realized in Germany when Apple Pay came into the market, um, they didn't open um, um, the the smartphones to the banks. So when you wanted to put your Sparkasse credit card onto the NFC um, switch on on your on your iPhone, Apple was saying, "Yeah, you can do that, do this, but at a price. It will cost you a certain amount of euro cents per transaction that we give you the opportunity using our NFC switch here." Um, and I and, and a colleague and me serving in the finance committee, working on legislation, we were saying, hold on a minute, that's not a level playing field because all the banks in Germany um, had that European legislation and were forced opening uh, their platforms to all the technology companies. But Apple was, was obviously trying to stop the banks from using um, their own uh, credit cards. So we introduced a legislation in the Bundestag. And what we realized was the, the finance ministry and the administration was trying to stop us at every minute. So they were they were coming up with problems why it is not possible and we why we should wait for two more years and so on and so on and what they and that's my point what they didn't realize is in two years time um, the market is gone the market is divided between maybe between Apple and Google and that's it so we need to be fast we need to come up with uh, legislation uh, to stop. That, uh, that situation where the big platforms, the big companies are grabbing all the market share uh, before we introduce legislation. And uh, um, last not least, um, 
we also came up with uh, with new antitrust legislation in Germany. We're debating this uh, uh, also this week. And I think it's crucial because um, the funny thing is um, dealing with all these platforms, you also re you really can use um, what uh, the the your, your microeconomics uh, introductory 101 book. Because um, I don't know uh, who came up with the idea that it is a good idea having these monopolies all over the place. So I think um, we need to be uh, uh, much, uh, much harder um, in, uh, in breaking up these monopolies and, uh, and especially in stopping that these monopolies are even growing faster. Um, for example, I mean, even though it's, it's, uh, it, it dates a couple of years back, but it's completely ridiculous that it was allowed by the regulators that Facebook could buy Instagram and WhatsApp. Because, I mean, Facebook was too big uh, in the first place, and then it was granted to buy upcoming other competitors. So this is not really innovative. This is really uh, the good old um, antitrust uh, legislation we already have in place. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jens. Uh, thank you for those remarks. We will now uh, move on to the discussion part of the seminar, but we will start off with a sort of remark as well by Karin Pettersson, who has not had the word yet. So uh, please, Karin, you may start and then we'll move on to the discussion part. Okay, can you all hear me and see me? Yeah. Okay, so thank you so much for inviting me to this, uh, to this uh, very interesting panel. Um, I will, we don't have so much time, so I'll just jump right in. Uh, so my background is in, in journalism. I'm an economist also by training and I've worked in, I'll, I'll use my experience from the media industry uh, for my comments because I've really seen uh, the two sides of um, the story that you're all telling, um, uh, both the disruption of the information landscape and the, and the public sphere in terms of uh, information uh, to citizens and how that has sh changed and, and shifted, but also I would say the disruption of the media industry and the effects of uh, the rise of the of the platforms in the economic space uh, when it comes to when when it comes to the media, and uh, and uh, Thomas, I think you talked about uh, Amazon as a as a dominant uh, market player who is functioning both as a uh, as a marketplace, but also selling its own products. And of course, in the media industry, we've had to deal with Google primarily uh, and the lack of insight uh, from regulators and from um, uh, from politics when it comes to the rise of Google using the um, the scale effects and the network effects and, and becoming both the advertising broker, um, the, really this, the, the big uh, organizing the whole advertising industry now and also uh, selling adverti advertising and being the advertising platform. And that of course has disrupted uh, journalism entirely. And we are now um, struggling to, uh, yeah, to, to, to survive basically. And I would, I really like this approach. I think, Thomas, you talked about the Mariana Matsukato and the entrepreneurial state. And I think as progressives, we need to have an idea of how to structure the economy. And, and uh, on, a, on a deeper level, we won't be able to fix the problem with the infodemic, uh, as Maya was referring to, or with creating a public sphere, public space, if we don't fix the problems in uh, more structural, deeper problems with these uh, massive uh, information monopolists or data monopolists that are now um, like chewing up, eating up everything. So um, maybe uh, Thomas, you talk about values in the public uh, in the public space. And just to add to the values that you were discussing, I would add pluralism because what we're seeing now in my space, the, in journalism, in information, is that the uh, the combination of the rise of the data monopolies and the algorithms um, driving information, driving this emotional, driving this very contentious 
uh, public discourse is the the this that pluralism disappears and what we are left with is uh, we're lucky enough in Europe to have public service broadcasters as you have in Germany as we have in Sweden but really the rest of the informa information landscape is uh, local journalism regional journalism is slowly di slowly dying and so we're left with this huge um, uh, um, public service broadcasters and then we have uh, subscription newspapers uh, catering to a very specific um, group of the public, uh, the urban, uh, upper urban middle class people who are able to pay for, for subscriptions. And then there's this void in between uh, where there's just no other players. And, and this is kind of a dystopian vision, but this is where, where we're heading, what we're heading towards. So we need a, a vision, I think, for the public space that is also when it comes to information, when it comes to journalism, when it comes to uh, creating, a, um, um, creating a space for public discourse, we need, the, we need the goal of pluralism. And I think in order to get there, you need to, yes, deal with antitrust, you need to, yes, uh, deal with the rise of monopoly, but you also need to figure out how the how we as a public can support uh, a multitude of different uh, voices, uh, news distributors, um, journalism projects. And I'm just going to stick with journalism now. I mean, this is a huge issue, so I could talk about other parts of the economy. Uh, but I'll just um, um, stick with that. Uh, so. I think um, I'll just maybe stay stop stop there. I think I my my view right now is pretty dark, and I just I'll just end with this. Maya said that we're moving uh, towards a place where we were maybe a hundred years ago, with this very fragmented information landscape, uh, with loud voices, very political, very partisan, and I think that's true. But the problem is also that this as we know that the playing field is not neutral, it's skewing towards um, type of content that is um, uh, very aggressive, um, that is uh, feeding hate, violence even, um, and, um, and so it's not, it's not giving equal weight to all these different voices in this new more fragmented landscape. So if we want a functioning public sphere, uh, as I said, pluralism must be a goal, and then we need to be very uh, clear about, um, uh, from the also political side, with what we want to um, what what we want to achieve and what the problems are. And this goes to both the economics of this, but also the um, um, the journalism itself and the and and supporting uh, the journalistic and information. Um, projects uh, that are now disappearing and dying slowly. Thank you. Thank you, Karin. So uh, I would like to start off by, as a matter of courtesy, perhaps handing the word to Thomas, because you've had a number of uh, points and uh, remarks made uh, with regards to your study. I would I'd like to give you the opportunity to, to comment on some of them. But I would also like uh, you to comment on one question uh, uh, with regards to your study. And it is that it seems to me that, that the study outlines a progressive and to some extent maybe social democratic framework rather than strictly a European one. Uh, so I'd like to know if you agree. And if so, uh, what are the prospects of achieving a unified European strategy for a digital humanism across party lines? Thank you. So please. Thomas. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm gonna stop, uh, start actually with the, I, I think we can cross the aisles in, in Europe with many of my ideas. If you talk to conservatives and economic development and you say something about open source, they would agree. Gaia X, uh, European server, data security, I think check, uh, I, I think with, with uh, even I think with the Commons idea and you know making Wikipedia and public broadcasting corporations easy, I, I think they would agree in that uh, on, on some, maybe not all of, I, I think where we would start moving into a disagreement would be the role of the state. 
then I think then on how active should be the role of an entrepreneur. Still. I think then there, I think that there's differences, but I think in some of my ideas, they are European. And I think it's easy to cross the party lines because I think everyone in Europe, or at least of all very democratic parties that have a democratic approach and, and, and subscribe to the basic European values, because we know in Europe, certain parties do not so subscribe that so I'm leaving out them of the equation that we have now. I would say they see the same problem that we get squeezed between two ideal types and we need to figure something out. So I think everyone's feeling that we have a problem there. So that would be the third. So I think they are European and I think we can cross uh, uh, the aisles with, with not all, but many of those ideas. And I wanna go into, I wanna say thank you to, to, to Karin also for the idea of pluralism. And, and I agree that's actually an important value that, that that's missing. So I, I really want to thank you here uh, because that's inherently important to also realize that I'm also saying it's also not about only pluralism in the public private sense, like there is space for different societal sectors. We just, it's, we need to have the balance and the pluralism uh, to not make sure it goes too far apart. So, so thank you for that. Um, uh, Jens and I, we have frequent discussions, so we, we know already, uh, uh, and, and I really like our discussions a lot, and I agree, at the end it's about the users, and we need to, and I'm also an entrepreneurship professor and strategy professor, we need to appreciate how good the big tech companies are. This is not easy, this is year-long experience, it's not only network effects. It's not only the huge economic power they have, but it's a really professional approach to a lot of things, and especially Google. Microsoft has a different approach to a lot of products and make them more or less decent and working. And have, I mean, they don't aim so much for perfection, but they're good enough. And, and we all complain about Microsoft products, but it's good enough for being a standard that everyone uses that. And it's okay, I mean, people can use uh, Microsoft, people can use Google, like let's have plurality. But my, and, and that would be my argument, if I think about all the universities, how much money we put into Zoom at the moment. And let's just think, how much money would we need for a good strategy to scale up something like Osnabrück as to make it more usable? And I don't know, but I would like to have a debate and a strategy discussion that we have a tool in place that we could do such a discussion, okay, seeing local universities and universities as a center of innovations, if something good comes out of there, do we have structure in place that we can scale it up? So what's the, what's, what's the European equivalent to the, you start with crowdfunding, then you go to the venture capitalist, to the AC, then to the VC, and then to the bank. What is our equivalent to it along the journey that we can grow and scale faster? I think that's something we, where we need to change the system. So, because I know that it's, it's going to be hard. This is um, others are so much better, but I still think with a lot of human ingenuity and mobilizing people, we can create viable alternatives. I don't think it's, here's very positive uh, entrepreneurial spirit also too. Like I, I still think alternatives are still possible. And one example, and I'm going to share my screen. Because I think it's 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 very useful for a debate. It ties to Maya's point. Existing institu institutions matter, and I want to show you an example. And I'm going to share the screen now uh, of the Fairtube campaign. This is a campaign where the German labor union IG Metall, together with the YouTubers Union, are successful in putting pressure on YouTube to improve the conditions for YouTubers. And this is interesting, like I, I would say the institutions of the old world and everything what we see is new here, but it's also like, let's make our institutions ready that they enter this new world, forge new alliances that we can have the social partnership dialogue. We also see in Germany that uh, there is actually uh, uh, an ombuds office uh, in Germany where the labor union is in negotiation with German platforms about certain standards for crowd work. And so they're doing the social partnership uh, dialogue in a sense. And, and of course, this is something we need to encourage um, to find ways how to govern 
and regulate those spaces. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, Karin uh, suggested the value of pluralism that you also addressed, Thomas, uh, as something that she'd like to, to suggest to be included in, in the report, uh, among the key values you highlighted. Um, personally, I would also have wished to see something more about the topics of uh, employment conditions and social sustainable business models in the report. Um, what about uh, you, Jens and Maya? Were there some things that you found were lacking or missing in the report and that you would have wished uh, to be addressed at length? Jens, how about you? I mean, obviously, you. This is such a broad topic, so you you you, you are able to to bring up uh, very uh, a, a lot of additional tasks in the report. So, but I I, I think um, it's 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 very it's very it's very straightforward and uh, and and gives uh, uh, and shows a, a clear vision. So, uh, no, I, I think it's 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 good in the way it is. Right. And my what do you say? I think it's interesting. I think there are, are strengths and challenges for doing a very broad report. And I think it, it's interesting because we get light on so many different parts of the decision. Uh, possibly, I mean, I think that the measures to deal with these different parts of society are actually rather different. I'm a strong uh, believer in social dialogue, for example, when it comes to what you point at, Shaman, uh, or social sustainable models of future work, etc. Uh, I also think that uh, Karin points to, to journalism in the future. How can we do qualitative journalism in an information landscape that is um, so scattered and uh, full of uh, um, power relations that are hard to challenge? I think it would be interesting to, act, to have that uh, developed at more length, I think, in the report, if I should come with any wish. Yeah. Thomas, would you like to make a rebuttal <laughs> no in that case i i mean i i always say things that are right as a living document and the conversation that we have is going to enrich it certainly it's always hard to make broad but be also be detailed um but it's it's really the thing i mean i i just recall uh it was always if we look at the history of, of and what role also progressive ideas played in building up new institutions like libraries to make education more accessible for a lot of people. Uh, and, and also this like in, in a sense, a socio-technical approach of thinking technology and the social institutions together, that's something um, where we're still experimenting. What, what, what are names, what are, what should these institutions look like? How can we transfer old ideas that still matter and make them also work in the 21st century? I, I recall a conversation that 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 Jens and I had about uh, what is what is what is the digital library in, the, in 21st age. So the, the example, the coding courses that I mentioned for women that obviously work well uh, because in, in in Berlin they just with their own resources, no funding, taught about hundreds. 1,600 women how to code. And this is just a, a nonprofit. We don't earn money by this and they did it. Imagine the scale we could have if this approach of how they teach to code is integrated in, I, I, I missed the English term in German, it's Volkshochschule or Volks, uh, uh, what's, what's um, continuing education programs. I'm, I'm not sure how this, it, institutions are called in Sweden or in the US. Um, there is so much, I, I'm a big fan of in, when we build the institution of what is the fabric or ideas we can take from our ex existing institution that work well, what are new ideas that emerge in the societal landscape they are obviously interesting like platform cooperatives, like these coding communities. Uh, like uh, open source spot and up thing and, and how can we fuse and integrate them and I'm also in the beginning of this thinking process uh, 
but we need to find the names and, 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 and create more concrete visions so we can transfer them into effective policy making. That would be in general my, 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 my view on, on how can we move forward. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Karin a question. Uh, you, you said that you had a pretty dark view at the moment. Uh, and uh, Jens previously spoke about the need for moving quickly, making fast uh, reforms and for legislators to, to act quickly. So just a simple question, how much time do we have, do you think? Because I mean, it seems to me that a lot of these things should have been uh, addressed like, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, how much time do we have? Well, we have the time that we have, no? I mean, <laughs> it is what it is, as someone said. Uh, no, I, my, I believe, um, um, I'm, I'm pessimistic in the sense that I believe that there are these very strong feedback loops between uh, how the rise of these um, uh, monopolies, data monopolies, um, in, in the economic sphere, in the information sphere, and um, the, um, how that feeds into the policy arena, how that feeds into the actual information ecosystem that we see now growing, and that in, it's t in turn feeds back into the policy and shapes policy. So I, it's difficult to get out of these loops when the economic interests and the political powers of these huge companies have grown uh, to the extent that they have at this point. And uh, I, I do see the importance and there, I mean, there's, uh, it, it's very, uh, it's encouraging what's happening in the European sphere and in Brussels. And I've been following that work pretty closely, not the last six months, or, but before that, and in terms of antitrust and in terms of, trying to figure out or trying to uh, shape a different vision of how um, the digi digital sphere could look. But we are uh, way behind. And I think in terms of my, what I said about pluralism, pluralism is in the information sphere, but pluralism is also in the economic sphere. I mean, when you reach a point where it's, where it's really hard for new companies to have entry in, into in the service industry or in, in getting funding for new innovation projects because these companies are so far ahead and they are so huge and it's just difficult to compete, then it's, then it's hard. And then I think going back to this uh, idea of the entrepreneurial state, then, the, then you need to have a, a stronger counterforce in terms of uh, the state channeling money, having a vision for for the public sphere, but we are uh, we, we are way behind on that, I think. And uh, um, yeah, so I don't know what to say, but it's good that yeah. uh, there are. I mean, there are so inter there are interesting ideas, interesting initiatives, and interesting agenda on the European level. Uh, and um, but I I do see the effects in 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 my industry in journalism, and I don't see any any signs at this point pointing to a change uh, of, of this um, um, quite dark development that we see um, yeah. right now. I'd like to continue on the topic of uh, competition that you uh, mentioned. Uh, and I have a question for the, the politicians in the panel. Uh, I'd like to start with Maya and then maybe Jens could uh, answer it. Uh, Thomas speaks in the report of uh, he uses terms such as a civilized market or digital humanism or values-based European platform strategy. But at the same time, we face a pretty ruthless competition from the US and China, which are, one could argue, less concerned with social and ethical considerations. Um, do you see a risk that a socially conscious and ethically regulated European approach would simply get run over by the competition from China and the US? I mean, is it, is it a, a faulty strategy in terms of competition to, to be socially aware or socially conscious? Maya, what do you think? Well, a short answer is, of course, uh, yes, definitely a risk there. And I think that, but also, well, that takes me back to COVID-19, sorry about always returning to the virus, but 
we have really seen the transnational, international cooperation bodies underperforming last year. And I feel a grief that we have such weak in, uh, international organizations because we need them in all these topics. I mean, we, we did believe we had free trade, didn't we? Or free movement within the EU, or et cetera, et cetera. We didn't have that when it came to crisis. And we have very weak international bodies when it comes to information. We have very, very weak international bodies when it comes to, when it comes to uh, criminality online uh, when it comes to to uh, different uh, types of uh, hate crime online and all these corporations are working way too slowly to actually establish an international rule of law online so i think there's definitely a, a large risk there that doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything on a european level i mean we still have a need for a strong european cooperation on this but we cannot leave the rest of the world outside for obvious reasons yes what do you think yeah, and 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 to, uh, um, to to continue on 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 that note, um, I think what what I learned is that um, the role of the parliaments is is really uh, is really crucial because uh, I mean uh, remembering, um, for example, I mean personally, I'm not a, her biggest fan, but uh, Alexandra Ocasio Cortez, when she grilled Mark Zuckerberg in in Congress. This was a this was a very um, strong uh, strong point on on simply on on, on showing that uh, the the fight against um, these uh, monopolies um, is is not it's it's not futile. So um, and uh, I we have uh, we have a, a initiative between parliaments um, against. Uh, hate speech and, and hate crime uh, on, on social media, uh, which was initiated by uh, the Canadian, uh, British and Irish uh, parliaments where, and, and I, I joined also uh, one or two of these, of these conferences. And what we learned is um, uh, that uh, uh, the, the parliaments the, and the legislatures really can make a difference in, in, in pushing also uh, governments and uh, also in connecting because I think um, it's uh, and I, I tried to make that point earlier um, the, the, the interesting aspect is it's it's not as if we as Europeans um, are alone on that on that issue I mean if you're if you're thinking about Japan South Korea India Africa South America so there are so many other countries uh, facing similar problems. And uh, I remember, I mean, this was unfortunately, um, it's, it's not possible with the current Brazilian administration, but um, Brazil was extremely progressive with their net mondial um, approach, where we ultimately were talking about internet governance and, uh, uh, and what we've seen also last year here in Germany, uh, Germany was hosting the internet governance forum. Uh, which is uh, a United Nations conference, uh, and uh, uh, it's it's a unique setting. It's a multi-stakeholder approach, and so um, yeah, it, the problem is these these institutions are acting not fast enough quite often, but nevertheless um, they are crucial and and they are a, a big opportunity to 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 simply join forces. Okay, we have just about two minutes left so Thomas I'd like to give you the final word if you can wrap up in just one minute uh, <laughs> what are views on competitiveness and maybe some other issues you'd like to to speak of I mean I think in one minute it's always hard to wrap up such yeah. a, a complex topic but uh, I think I, I would take this last 30 seconds just to say we need to get better and, and let's start working on it. Let's bring all the different societal sectors together. So I'm, I'm on the optimistic side and let's develop and devise a plan, find our spot and, and, and fill it. Uh, that would be my uh, approach for, for moving forward. Right, I would say that this seminar is one of those examples of bringing various sectors of society together actually. Um, so I'd just like to end by thanking Thomas Gegenhuber, Jan Zimmermann, Philip Fink, Karen Petersson, and especially Maya Fiestad, who took time in, this, uh, in the middle of this pandemic to be here today. 
Uh, and I'd also like to thank the audience, of course, who've been watching this. Uh, you can spread it to, to people who will be interested because uh, the link will be available on, on our Facebook pages, uh, Arjen Idea and uh, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a nice day. <laughs>